All right, so thanks for hanging in while we did quick equipment swap and reset up. So for the second half of our New York Java SIG talk, Nicholas from Aldebaran, am I saying that right? Yeah. Oh, okay, Aldebaran Robotics um, and myself are going to present the now robot. So let me pop up your presentation. Okay, that doesn't look right. Hold on just a sec. Wow. PowerPoint. All right, close you. <sighs> I closed the wrong one. Okay, and now I can do. Yeah. Great. That looks better. Okay, so take it away, Nicholas. Yeah. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for being there. I'm really happy to do this uh, talk with Steve tonight. Uh, my name is Nicolas Rigo, and I'm working for Aldebaran Robotics. Uh, that is now known as Aldebaran. We decided to change name just last week. So this is the big news. We're going to introduce you to now robot. I'll do the first part of this at Aldebaran. I'm a community leader, meaning that I'm leading the community of developers working with the robot. And uh, Steve is going to do some demonstration just after my introduction with uh, some Java and how to use Java with the, with the robot. Just to give you a brief uh, view about our history, because robotics is not something that is that trendy at the moment. Um, to explain this story, so the story started in Paris something like uh, almost 10 years ago. Our CEO decided to create this company to build a new species of robots. All of you have already, be, have already heard about robot toys, about industrial robots, these kind of things, but he wanted to create something new. And his idea was to create companion robots, robots that would, you would have at home and that would take care of you. So this is really something that was new because at this time everybody was thinking about smartphones. This was the big trend in uh, 2005. And he decided to create in Paris this company that was that intended to create uh, humanoid robots. So this is Bruno Maisonnier, who is our CEO. And uh, you can see the different iterations that led to uh, creating uh, now by the end. At the very beginning, this was only some prototypes, and then we started having a nice shape around the robot. The design is really something that is important to us because we tend to think that if you want to create companion robots, you immediately need to create a connection with the people that are going to use these robots. And for that, the shape and the design of the robot is really something that is important. At the moment, as you can see, the robot is not that big. It's the size of a two-year-old kid. So people feel really comfortable when they see it. They don't think it's a human. Obviously, you can see that it's a robot. It looks with some plastic pieces and so on. But having uh, legs, having arms, a head, and something like that, you tend to project on this kind of device something different than what you can project on a phone. It's no longer an object. It's not a human. But People start not really having feelings, but it's something that is in between. So the design is really something that is important for us, and that was the reason for some decisions that we that we made. You can see the latest on this uh, on this page that was created in 2008. We just released a new version of this robot uh, two weeks ago, which is the now Evol. Now that is called now Evol, but that is the uh, version number five. Something, yeah, uh, version number five. Why we decided to create, uh, why have we created now? Now as different usage, uh, our goal, as I was stating, since the beginning was to address the consumer market, but uh, this market was not waiting for us. And so we decided to work at first with the first guys who were interested in working with us and in buying our robots. And these were the guys organizing the RoboCup. If you're not familiar with it, the RoboCup is an initiative whose goal is to have a soccer game by 2050 between humans and robots, and robots are going to win. So that's what they want to do, and at the moment, they just do soccer match from uh, teams of robots uh, robot, uh, against uh, teams of robots, and 
until we met them. They were using the dog made by Sony, Ibo, that maybe you ever heard about. And after creating Nao, we went to see them and told them that obviously it's not a team of dogs that is going to, beat, uh, to defeat one day a team of humans. So they should start thinking about using humanoid and they decided to adapt our, uh, our robot. This had some uh, impact on the design of the robot. Usually people tend to think that the cameras are in the eyes. In fact, these are uh, infrared sensors that are in the eyes. The two cameras that the robot has is one is just there and the other is here. Why we made this choice is that it's because to play soccer, the robot needs to look at the field and to monitor what's happening, and at the same time to pay attention to what's happening just in front of him in order to avoid obstacles and to be sure that he can hit the ball. So this is one of the reasons why the cameras are not in the eyes and just, uh, and just like that. But the RoboCup was our first client, and it's still, uh, now is still the, the official platform for the Standard League. This year, the RoboCup is going to take place just after the World Cup, in Brazil, so we hope that this will, it will have a lot of attention. Another use case for our robots, uh, we call this Ask Now, which does, must not make so much sense for you at the moment. Ask Now is an initiative whose goal is to help kids with autism. Uh, one of the universities we were working with uh, decided to buy robots and to launch some experiments uh, using the robot with kids, and it happens that these kids uh, had a good feeling with the robot. Uh, they were immediately connected to it, and the robot can do things that us as humans cannot do. When you work with autistic kids, you need to repeat a lot of things a lot of times in order to help them enhance their communication skills. And as humans, when you are repeating things for a hundred times, by the end you tend to get bored, to be nervous. This never happens with a robot. So it's really a device that makes it really easy for kids with this disease to interact with. And it's called Ask Now, now because the idea was not just to sell robots to school and let people play with that. The idea was to use these tools as something that the teachers can rely on. It's attractive for the kids, so they play with the robot. They have tasks that they can perform. And the teachers can follow the progress of these kids. So this is also the interesting part, that at the same time as you are playing with the robot, the robot is monitoring uh, what you are doing, and you can see results, the evolution, all this kind of thing that makes sense for educators, but also for parents when it deals with people that they care for. So these were the first two usages that we, uh, the first two use cases that are really making sense. But we decided not to stop only with, uh, with now because uh, we want to do humanoids, lots of humanoids, and this was our second project. It's called Romeo, like in Romeo and Juliet, and this one is really bigger, as you can see on the, on the picture. This robot, the goal for this robot is to take care of the elders. So it's not just our robot, it's a European project. We are several companies working on this one. But we want to use him in order to take care of people, to allow them to stay at home. And so the difference, the main difference with this little boy is that this one will be able to carry heavy stuff and to move it from one room to the other. So for the elders, this should really be something that might be really helpful. And this could also prevent us from being sent to hospitals too early. These robots, we think, will help keep people in their own home, and this has an impact on their mood, I'd say. When you have to be in an hospital in a, in a place that you don't really know, it's not something that makes you that comfortable. Being able to stay at home, even if you have some disease or even if you cannot do everything you used to be doing when you were younger, is something that is pretty good. So Romeo is going to be this kind of robot. And uh, we released just last week another robot that we did for our uh, main investor. Our company uh, is now financed by a company that is called SoftBank. I don't know if you're familiar with this. SoftBank is not a bank but it's a company that is making, uh, that, has a, um, that is a mobile provider in Japan, one of the, if not the first one, one of the two first um, operator. And they came two years ago to ask us to create a new robot for them. It's the robot that you can see there, that you should be able to see there. His name is Paper. i let you just see the pictures. In terms of design, you can see that there is some points that are exactly the same as for uh, now, but it's a bigger robot with wheels this time, it's not working. So 
So this robot one day will also be in almost everybody's home, but at the moment what's interesting is that this robot is used for business. Uh, our investor, SoftBank, wanted robots to have in their store and to interact with people. They are, uh, were thinking that it was important to have these kind of things, and so that's why we decided to have a robot that has also a tablet, because it's easier for the interaction in order to uh, showcase some stuff and things like that. But these robots are already in store uh, since last week. Uh, there are two stores, I think, in Tokyo where you can meet this robot. We think that if people get used to interacting with robots in shops, soon after that they will, want, they will be ready to have robots in their home. Uh, for robotics, there are two main challenges. One, which is about hardware and software, making it better and so on. And the other is about acceptance. I think that Japan is maybe one of the first countries that is really ready to accept robots in their life. I would say that that's just everything they wait for at the moment. That's all they expected to be able to have robots. But uh, this is a challenging part for us, for the rest of the world, because not everybody is feeling confident at the moment having robots. We tend to think that the robots we are making, emotional robots, will find their place quite easily in your life in the two to five years to come. Speak so speaking of Japan, um, I was just there a few weeks ago. Yeah. And um, what he was talking about, about acceptance of, of robots and automation. So a good example, this was my first time ordering from a vending machine. So when you walk into like these small restaurants in um, Shibuya, you have to press buttons on a vending machine, put money in, and then it spits out a little card. You don't actually place an order with a human. You hand the card to the chef, and he cooks your food, and then gives it to you. <laughs> the so I think, I think they're ready. <laughs> the, the, the reason why we think uh, uh, robots will be more interesting than screens is that you can naturally interact with them. I say naturally, but in fact, it's just the idea that I can talk to it. I to give a personal example, my grandma has lots of problems, for example, just using a simple mouse. She doesn't understand why moving a mouse can have some impact on a small arrow that she can see on the screen. If she was to interact with uh, a robot, it would be easy. She has nothing to learn. She just has to speak to the robot. And all the job is done by the robot, understanding what she wants to say, not necessarily just what she says, but what she wants to say. Uh, it means that she, we also have to take into account the tone of the voice, the, the emotions people are feeling, the words they are using. Our CEO gives an example. He says, sometimes when I talk to my wife, I say yes, but in fact I'm thinking no. I want the robot to be able to understand <laughs> these kind of things. <laughs> so it might sound funny, but body language, you, everything is not just what you say. It's the tone of your voice, it's the way you, uh, the things you are looking at, and so on. So all of this makes the message, and we want our robot to be able to understand that and to uh, reply accordingly to this, uh, to these informations. Uh, to give you an overview quickly about the company, today so our headquarters, I guess you guessed from my accent, are in Paris. Uh, all the R&D is done in Paris. We also have an office in Boston, an office in Shanghai, and an office in Tokyo. We are at the moment about the figure is no longer true, but I think we are about 400 uh, employees, and we have more than 5,000 copies of this first robot that are already uh, that have been sold worldwide uh, to universities, to research labs, and to a certain number of individual developers who start preparing the future. We rely on the individual developer because, as I was saying, we want these robots to be in everybody's home. At the moment, uh, these developers, they buy the robot and they start experimenting at home. They have the robot at home and they start thinking, oh, maybe that would be cool if my robot could be able to do that or would do that for me. And they have the skills in order to make this happen. So they start creating apps and uh, just the same thing as you have with smartphones, for example. We, will, uh, we feel that we are in charge of the platform, making the hardware, making the OS that is running on the robot, and delivering the tools that you can use to create behaviors for the robot. But we are relying on the community of developers to create the usages. Uh, working in the robotic fields at the moment, it's almost the same thing as working in the computer industry at the end of the 70s. The guys were convinced that one day there would be computers in everybody's home, but the market was not ready. People were like, why would I need a computer? And you can see the results 30 years after. Everybody has computers, smartphones, and so on, and you just feel lost when you don't have them. We think that robots, it will be the same thing. We don't know exactly yet what will be the usages, what people will want to do with these robots at home, but for sure they will want to have robots at home. So 
That's why we need developers to come join this new adventure and start working on this new world that we are trying to make happen. Now, a quick overview about the, the hardware. We have 25 degrees of freedom on this robot. Um, we have two cameras. Maybe it will be a bit easier if I show you. Hop. Yeah. So I was trying to clear space so we can put him up here. Oh I can keep it in my hands. Yeah. So on this robot, we have infrared sensors in the eyes, as I was saying uh, at the beginning. We have two cameras here. We have four microphones around the head so the robot can locate where the sound is coming from. We have two speakers in the ears. In the back of the robot here, oh sorry, we have a USB port which allows you to enhance the capabilities of the robot. You can put a Bluetooth dongle, for example, or this kind of things. We have some developers that have been working on plugging a Kinect, for example, and using uh, this 3D sensor with the robot. Uh, you got an inertial board in the torso. It's, uh, work it's working with the um, sensitive resistance, the force, sensitive, uh, the force resistance that we have under the foot, so the robot can know if he's falling or if he's standing exactly as it should be. We have a tactile zone on the head that allows you to pass message to the, the robot. It's a three zone tactile, uh, tactile zone. We have tactile sensor on the hands too and some bumpers on the foot. So if now is to run into a wall, then he knows that he has to, to go back. And then different sensor inside of the robot in order to monitor the temperature of the motors, for example, or this kind of things. Uh, so here is for the um, for the hardware, of course, you got uh, an atom, uh, an atom inside of the robot with uh, 1.6 gigahertz, and uh, uh, I guess you can read the details. We also have a software suit that comes with the with the robot. Uh, no, I'm going too far. Um, the OS of the robot, I, uh, Steve is going to say some words about it, is uh, is completely made by uh, by us. Our idea is really to make sure that. We make uh, software that is as easy as possible to use. At the moment, there are lots of companies that are making robots, that are making nice hardware. But what makes the difference is how easy it is to use the software and to program new behaviors for this robot. One of the big challenges for the developer is also to take into account body language. Because uh, the computing part is not that hard, I guess, for developers. But when you deliver a message through a robot, the fact that it's got a body you got to take advantage of that. The robot cannot just be like yes, no, or whatever. He needs to move uh, to highlight what he's saying. When he says yes, he has to move saying yes. When he says no, maybe you can have it saying no. But body has really an importance. And that's maybe the most important subject that developers have to pay attention to. Uh, the ro a robot is not just a screen. And so body language is something that is really important. Steve is going to present you, I guess, the OS of the robot and the way that we are dealing with it. And then we are going to do some uh, examples of how yep. to use Java with the robot. So thank you very much for listening to me. And if you have some questions after the demonstration, I will be really happy to answer them. All right. So um, you know, my interest is getting, of course, Java running on the now robot. Um, Aldebaran and Nicholas have been really helpful in terms of, um, you know, working with the evangelism team to make sure we could test out the robots, get Java working on it, and also show it at different events and conferences. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the architecture of how the now robots operating system is designed, and then show you guys some example applications of Java running on the now robot. Um, so basically, the operating system of the now robots called Nowchi. Uh, most of the code is written in C on the robot, so they have algorithms for, um, you know, balancing the robot, for motion, for controlling the LEDs and the sensors, which Nicholas mentioned. And basically, it's broken into a bunch of modules, so you can access different modules, and each of these modules has a bunch of routines and methods which you can call on them. And it's it's done in a way where you can call it from multiple different languages and still access the same APIs. So on the robot right now, you can code in either C or Python to ship applications. And they also have support for Java and then upcoming support for other languages. JavaScript. Like too. JavaScript. Um, here's an example of some of the different modules which are available. So memory, motion, text-to-speech, speech recognition, video, battery, face detection, 
audio source location so you can you know track different audio sources navigation audio player etc so there's a bunch of different modules and capabilities one of the nice things about working with the now robot is a lot of the capabilities you need to build interactions to do simple animations to do all this stuff is built into the robot already so as an application developer you don't need to start developing from scratch you can use a lot of the algorithms and things which the the Aldebaran engineers have already worked on and you can focus more on building applications and interactions with the the physical world um, and they also have a software suite called Choreograph. Um, it's a visual software seat suite where you can actually see either a real robot or a 3D simulated robot. So it'll show you a 3D representation of what your current robot position is or give you a mocked up robot which you can animate. Um, it has a drag and drop interface for programming the robot by dragging boxes and wiring them up using multiple inputs and outputs. And you can also drop in programming boxes here to do a more advanced behavior. So you can drop in a, a box and then have it do different complicated algorithms right from the Choregraph software. That's it. The reason why we decided to do Choregraph is because it's a tool that makes it easy for people to animate the robot. It for people who are 3D animators, it looks like uh, the tools that they are using usually. So this tool makes it easy to animate the robot, but what's impossible with Choregraph is to connect to other devices or to connect to web services, for example. So for these kind of things, you need to rely on our SDKs and then to do real code. But this is a great tool specifically in order to teach kids, for example, how to code. For kids, robots are really something great, and using this kind of tool makes it really easy. So it's really rewarding for them to discover that they can move this robot just by dragging some boxes, connecting them, and let the magic happen just after that. Yeah, so it's a good way to get started. Um, as Nicholas mentioned, it's great for kids. So him and I have both run workshops with kids for DevOps for Kids using Choregraph and um, Middle Age. Um, kids about you know 10 to 14 years old and um, they really take a liking to the form factor and the animation of the robot and are able to do quite interesting things without a lot of work so here is an example of um, wiring up a box to have the robot say hello and I think you know rather than looking at slides maybe we should actually try running choreograph and see if we can get it working right mm. okay so we have our robot here, and we have possibly the right version of Choregraph, um, and an empty behavior here. And let's have him say hi. Before that, we're going to have him stand up. Um, and then just wire the boxes together, and we can change the text he's going to say. Um, let's see. Right now he get, does a gesture, hello, and we'll change this to hello, New York, Java SIG. Okay, so we don't really have optimal conditions for our robot <laughs> to be moving, <laughs> but let's give this a try. Um, oh, and I have to actually connect to him. So we'll see that when he you connect the robot... Yeah. He actually needs a little more room behind position. him because he's going to push his hands behind to stand up. <laughs> All right. And oh yeah, you can see the video there. He's staring at you guys already. So that's the live video and the position. Okay. So it's installed the application on the robot. He is doing an animation to go from a sitting to a standing position. This is how he died at DevOx for France and broke his foot, by the way. Hello, New York, Java Sig. <laughs> okay, so a really simple, <laughs> a really simple example of using Choregraph, and you can do more complicated stuff, you know, simple looping and then multiple input output conditions using the software. But we're Java hackers. What we'd prefer to be doing is we'd prefer to be actually coding in a in a real IDE. So I have an example here using the, um, um, the Qi messaging Java API um, for directly talking to the robot. And you can see here, here's the Hello World application. So basically, you can hook up 
directly to a port on the robot. The way the Qi messaging protocol works is even if you're running a local application, you'll just hook up over TCP to a local port to talk to it. Um, you send messages, so I'm getting the text module and then sending it a message to say, hello, New York Java SIG. Do, do, do. I love Java. Am I putting words in his mouth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what this will do is it will hopefully hook up to the right port. Let's check. Oh, wrong, wrong number. <laughs> All right, so if we put the right, IP the right IP address in, then he should hook up. And thanks, thanks for letting me know. Hello, New York Java SIG. I love Java. <laughs> okay, so, so did you know that, that he loves Java? He told me. <laughs> he already told me. <laughs> All right, very good. Um, some other examples of things you can do. So, you know, we mentioned there's tactile sensors on his head. So, what this second application does is it takes advantage of the tactile sensors. And um, when the front tactile sensor is touched, the one right up in front here, then he's going to say hi and he's going to wake up and go into a stand position. When the middle tactile button or the rear tactile button is touched, He's going to say, you know, now I'm going to rest because I'm tired and I'll sit back down, either synchronously or asynchronously. And then finally, when we kick his foot, he's going to stop the application. So let's give this one a try. Uh. Okay, so take now a Now I'm going to rest because I'm really tired. You look tired. Hi, thank you. Okay, so do, do when you guys want to try touching his head, Frank, Frank, come on up here. So if you want him to sit down, just touch the middle or back of his head. Just give him a nice little. Now I'm gonna rest because I'm really tired. And you notice when you touch his head, you can now see I'm it kind of lighting up. I'm really tired. Hi, thank you. Now I'm gonna rest because I'm really tired. <laughs> <laughs> So as you can see, we, we launched 20 threads, and then we blew our stack. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's how you know this is a real demo. OK, now the, the next demo requires a little bit of space for him to walk around. And I'm not sure how he's going to like no, this. I'm not sure on the carpet it's going to work perfectly. But yeah. we can try. We'll, we'll give it a try, but there might be a little bit of, um, I don't know, <coughs> unhappiness. But basically, um, this will pick up his voice, or he's going to do voice detection, and he is going to attempt to um, walk around the room based on our voice commands. So let me run the program. And the voice commands we have for him are wake, come, and stop. Okay, did, why aren't you standing up? Did you stop the previous application? Yeah, that's, that's, oh, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, all right, kick his foot. Okay. Yeah, I guess the previous one is stopped, but it might not actually be stopped. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to change a step back and then have him finish the previous program, and then we'll see if he's happier. Uh, let's try three. This is the one I was playing around with earlier today. So this one, he tries to follow sounds around the room. Okay. All right, come here. Uh-huh. So you see he's, he's trying to kind of walk towards me. Now if I 
If I move over here, come come here. All right, you can stop walking where I used to be now. Try walking this way. All right, he really wants to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. Yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, and as you can see, we've aga again reached the loop threshold, and he's happily shut off. All right, let's let's try this one again. Shoot. Okay, so our commands are come, come, come. Maybe it's too low. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wake, wake, stop. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that one works great. Just, just All right. So we're gonna we're gonna try the last one, which is gonna take a picture of the audience. So how how do you guys like getting your picture taken by robots? <laughs> Maybe we should put him there then. Yeah, that so works. We can see people. Let me see what's running on the robot. Okay, well obviously not the program we want to run. Let's try this. Hello, New York Travel State. Okay, let's try this one again. Mm. No Chi applications running. Huh. Okay, maybe it is time to reboot him. <laughs> you think you want to do that? Yeah, but it takes a while. Yeah. Can try. No, my battery will soon need charging. There. We needed a demo curse, so I think that uh, we have hours this time again. Okay. It's disconnected. That's good. Yeah. Oh, he's still shutting down. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Java API while he's Minoric. booting up. Yeah. Okay, so the Qi messaging API, um, basically it's a framework you can hook up with different applications. Um, so if you looked at the code, you get an application, and then you can get a session to hook up to the, uh, the robot and then pull down different modules as objects. And then this is the code I showed you earlier that actually says hello. So that's how you can program the robot to have interaction. I do that. You got it? And um, this is the code which I was showing you, which is the current API. But the plan is to have a, a more um, Java-friendly API. So if you notice on this line, um, you're getting the module and then calling methods directly on it. In the previous one, it, this is kind of the raw form where it's actually sending the method you want to call as a string, um, which you know, this is what's going to, and the underlying framework in Qi messaging, what it'll send across anyway. But the goal is to have a more programmer-friendly syntax and future version of the Java Qi messaging API. And, you know, demo time. 
So this is a good time to ask questions about the now robot while we wait for him to reboot. Um, so let Barry know if you want to have the mic, and then Nicholas or, or myself can help answer questions about the robot. Oh, uh, that's because you press the power button, but so it shouldn't really matter. Yeah, just yeah, that's fine. That's fine. There you go. Um, so the Romeo version of the robot. So can it actually help somebody stand up if they have fallen down? That's a good question. It depends on the way you think that uh, they will help you. I mean, you think about. Someone who would be lying on the floor, and for example, and the robot would help you get back on your feet. The first idea was this one. But when you start thinking about it uh, in real life, what happens if the robot falls on the person he is supposed to put back on his feet? This, so that's a big risk. So this is not the strategy we decided to follow. If someone is lying on the floor, what the robot should be doing at first is he's going to be coming close to you, being like that, so you can you know, use the robot in order to get back yourself on your feet if you can. If you cannot, maybe you can still talk. So the robot can turn into some kind of phone where you can call emergency and you can talk through the robot. And if you're just unconscious, then the robot can by himself eventually call the emergency. What's interesting is that emergency would be able, for example, to connect to the robot and see through his eyes if this is a real emergency case, or if it's not the case. So that's the way we see it. But in fact, for the robots, there is a lot of fantasy about how they should be with us. And there is also to take into account real life and the real risks. So that was a great idea to think that robots would be taking you up <laughs> on your feet. But in real life, that's not the way it's going to happen, I think. How much does a robot cost and uh, the accompanying software to uh, develop with it? How much does the robot cost and, to, and the software resources the, you need? The software will come with the robot. Uh, if you buy a robot, you will have the OS, the software choreograph we are presenting to program it, and access to all the SDKs. You will have free updates for the software, etc. How much does it cost? It used to be... $15,000 in the US. We managed to drop the price two or three months ago, and the price at the moment is about $8,000 uh, $8, uh, for a robot. Depending on the use, you can maybe, for personal use, get some discount in order to lower a bit more the price. But at the moment, this is the price of this robot. How about the licensing part of the software? Let's say you develop something, who owns it? Sorry, Let's about say the licensing? Yeah, the licensing of the development work you do on the so on for the robot. There, there Let's say I, own, I purchase a robot, I do some development, what sort of license uh, you, uh, I'm you, going by? You want to do some development for the robot, you create an application, something like that, and what is the license for this uh, application? Like, is it owned by the own parent company, or is it open source, or is it... Uh, it belongs to well, you. You do the development, okay. the, the behaviors belong to you. You can decide to share them for free. Uh, you can decide to have resources that are, or that are open source, uh, okay. that you will share with the community, and you can also decide that you want to make a business and sell them. Okay, thanks. There are different approach for that. We are trying to make sure that people collaborate because robots are so complex that I think that to create real interesting applications, people will have to gather together uh, to mix competencies. It will be really hard for one person alone to create an app. Uh, even for a developer, usually, we are trying to provide them with some solutions, for example, in order to animate the robot. But this is not necessarily always the best solution. So uh, we see teams of guys where we have developers and animators. Uh, this is the way it's going to happen. But uh, so some of these guys working together, usually they don't want to make money out of the projects they are creating. So it's 
most of the time something that is open source and that other people will try to support, for example. But our goal is really to attract companies who want to make a business out of, uh, out of applications for robots. Uh, just the same way that you can see this business on smartphone, for example. We don't have exactly the same definition of what is an application. Uh, we could talk about this uh, for a long time, but even if it's not the same approach for what is an application, there will be the same business models. Uh, we want to gather an ecosystem that is also making a living out of this robot. If we want to be successful addressing the consumer market, this is, I think, the only way that we can follow. Yep. I see that uh, Romeo and, and the others are very human-like, and you have uh, two arms, two legs, a head, and is that largely to uh, the psychological effect on people? Uh, is it possible that maybe some other type of design would be more efficient for the work it's trying to do, but you make the design very human-like for the yeah. psychological effect? Okay. Th this is our goal, really. What we want is to create robots people will want to interact with. And for that, the shape is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've ever Sometimes people ask us, can this robot clean my floor? No, and it will never do that. <laughs> you already have a Roomba that is a robot just right. designed perfectly for that. But nobody wants to talk to a Roomba uh, mm -hmm. that will feel awkward to do, so, do something. So the use case would rather be, I want to interact with this. So I will talk to him, and he will connect to my Roomba and send the orders. But I can talk naturally with this robot. Please make sure this floor, uh, this room, will be cleaned. And then he will send the bits and the zero and the one that make sense for the Roomba. But I don't want to do that. Uh, if you think about home automation, that's another example that I usually give. I don't want to deal with all these buttons and try to understand exactly why what kind of thing I have to create. I want the robot to do that for me. I would just talk and that's all. But the shape is important for that. We don't want to look like human. I, you see it's plastic. But Sorry. the shape is important because that's more engaging for people than just a piece of plastic. Yeah. But if you notice, for example, on paper, the last robot we released, we don't have legs this time. We have wheels for the, for the robot. But the rest of the body is really human-like. Uh, how long does the robot work when powered by a battery? If the robot keeps dancing something like 45 minutes, with the last version of the robot that we released, we, you can use the battery up to two hours, two hours and a half if the robot is not dancing all the time, for example, if, it's just having a, if you're just having a regular use. What we try to do is not necessarily to enhance uh, even more the battery. It would mean having bigger batteries and redesigning the robot in order to make sure that it's not going to have an impa a bad impact on its balance and so on. So what we decided to do is to create a charging station for the robot. And since we want him to look like a human, we created a chair. So we redesigned just this part of the robot. No, I'll show for everybody, just this part. Uh, the battery is just behind, we use uh, two connectors here, and when the robot gets to his chair and sits on it, then it starts recharging. So it gives the idea that he's human uh, because he's sitting on a chair, and at the same time he's recharging. What we are now working on is to make sure that with the robot navigating inside your home or in stores, he can monitor his battery at the same time and know how much battery he needs to get back to the charger. If I'm here, I will need 5%, but if I'm there, I will need 10%. And so, by this way, make sure that the robot can always be alive. Is your robot just the same size, or there is a different size? Another question. For this one? Mm -hmm. the, there is only one model for this one, so it's just this size. But why we decided to do that, it's because it's easier for people to feel comfortable with a small robot. When you see Romeo, for example, which is bigger, you don't get the same feeling at first. The second reason why we did that is that it's easier, we think, to start with a small robot and then to go bigger. If you think about Asimo, the robot by Honda, for example, it's a great robot, but you need 40 engineers around it to make it work at the moment, even just for a simple demo, as you can see. Sometimes you have some problems, but we can easily do a demo, just one or two people with this robot. And we think that from what we learned with this one, we can make a bigger one, Pepper or Romeo, recycling all the technologies and so on. So this is the path we choose, and so far it seems that it's the good one. So, so for, for your example, like a Pepper, 
were they able to pick up something on the floor, like, like you know, would a finger or hand is able to carry some weight, or is uh, more for about just voice? For paper, he can grab objects, he can carry objects, but I'm not sure that he can grab heavy objects on the floor, just because of the legs, in fact, uh, of, the, uh, of the wheels, in fact. It's not that easy for him to bend down to the floor to grab something. But uh, yeah, the goal for this robot is to carry stuff for you from one room to another, etc. So you're able to balance when the weight when the weight yeah, changes. Yeah, he's okay. dynamically he's balancing the robot. He's always monitoring its center of mass uh, in order to make sure that he can stay on his feet. And for now, for example, uh, we are we have something that we call the fall manager because we cannot prevent the robot from falling. It has to happen sometime, uh, not necessarily because of the robot, but because, for example, he will work on something that is not that flat and changing the balance, he will have to fall. So what we worked a lot on is to make sure that first the robot will be able to protect himself and the most expensive part of the robot. So when he's detecting that he's falling, usually what he does is protecting his head. Hello, and then I'm not Chavez. I love Jonathan. And then when he's on the floor, whatever the position he's in, uh, he always knows how to get back up on his feet all alone. So uh, we did a lot of demonstration about this on the booth at QCon today. You can have it lying on the face, on the back, or whatever the position. He knows how to get back all alone on his feet. If it's not the case, if he doesn't manage to do that, sometimes it happens, he calls for help. He asks you to help him. And this is also another element that is creating a relationship between you and the robot. When he asks for help, it's really hard to say, well, no, I don't care, and to move away. <laughs> you feel like you have some responsibility in helping the robot. So this is also important, because the idea is not to see robots as perfect uh, machines. They also have problems, and they are ready to ask for you to help them. OK, so you guys ready to get your picture taken? <laughs> Going to take a photo. One, two, three, smile. Sending me the picture by mail. Okay, so it's a little fuzzy, but I can kind of see Frank in the bottom there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an example of how you can access the, the camera from a Java library to take a picture. So are you guys developing any kind of attachments or applications that y you talked about that this is primary application is helping people around, right? So like what, uh, what are the other applications that you guys are working on already? Uh, inside the company? Yeah. We don't work a lot on applications. The, the applications we are working on at the moment are mainly applications that are used for education and for special education. But Apart from that, we have enough work at the moment just making sure that the platform <laughs> and the software are good enough. So we have some guys that are doing some developments for their own usage. We have this community of developers that is also making some proof of concept or developing applications. What are these applications? Mostly games, uh, dances at the moment. But people were waiting for us to deliver a new software version that will help them enhance what they can do with the robot. Uh, the new one I was talking about that is going to be released soon is going to bring a lot of enhancement about dialogue with the robot, about ease of interaction with it. And that's what we feel responsible for at first. I think this will be a bit different the day we will start addressing the consumer market because by this time I think we will have a clear view of what people expect at least from the robot. Uh, we will have a clear view of what must be the first experience when you buy it, bring it home and when for the first time you turn him on, what do you expect from him? This is going to happen. So we are going to create some apps. Uh, this is necessary, but it's not, we are not at this stage yet. At the moment, we are still enhancing the platform and the software. I'm going to take a photo. One, two, three, smile. OK. That's, that's a little bit more clear now. Much is better it, picture of Frank. Frank visibly. Yeah. And the, the other thing which it's doing, so this is something which would be you know, hard to do in Choregraph, is sending it via email. So it's actually using um, the Java mail protocol mm -hmm. to send it out over Gmail. And as you can see, I just got an email. <laughs> and there's an email of the picture from our now robot. Another question? No? 
Yeah. Okay. So I think last question. Um, wait till you get the mic from Barry. What about uh, machine learning uh, stuff? Does it have any machine learning capability? You're asking something that is far too technical for me. <laughs> I'm really sorry, but I'm not sure that I can answer that. Um, I'd be happy to. It's not that I don't want to answer, but I honestly don't know about that. But I can connect you if you're interested with the guys that are working specifically on this topic. Uh, if you want to have some feedbacks from our company, because obviously this is a subject that is really important. But I'm just a marketing guy, to be honest. So this is something that <laughs> is a, a bit too high level for me at the moment. Yeah, I think I'm the, sorry for that. the mapping algorithm for mapping rooms, where he walks around and gets a mental map of rooms, mm. is that's a form of machine learning. Um, uh, we worked on that uh, for paper. Uh, I can give you technical details if that was your question. But for example, for paper, the last one we released and this announcement are going to also be shared with, uh, with now. We want the, the simple fact that the robot, in the future, uh, the robot will need to adapt to you. So by observation, by uh, understanding your routines or the things that you care for. Uh, we plan by this way to make sure that he will adapt, uh, fine tune his behavior to what you expect or to what you like. But uh, this is also, we at Aldebaran, we have something that we call the A-Lab, uh, that is basically a robotic laboratory. And these are I really, at the moment, still subjects that are not uh, how to say it? There are still some investigations, some research to be done on this kind of thing. So uh, I think it's more on this side at the moment, uh, some theoretical, uh, theoretical research, uh, this kind of things that are happening and not necessarily completely inside of the robot. But I can once again connect you with people who will be able to give you more details about that. I'm sorry for the last question, uh, to be able to say more. That's, uh, I feel a bit shameful for that. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, so probably, you know, I know I know, not everyone here is attending the QCon conference as well, but you might just want to mention the session you're giving tomorrow for some folks yes. who are at the conference. If you are, there are two things I wanted to say to conclude. So the first is that tomorrow, uh, if you are attending QCon, our CEO will be there, and I think that he will have a nice talk. Uh, he should do some introduction about his vision about personal robotics. And uh, he's, far more, he's far more convincing than I am uh, because it's his vision, so of course. And uh, we'll also have one of our lead engineers who will be there to present really in detail the, uh, our OS, the choreograph, and some of the some SDK. I'm not sure it's going to work with Java, but maybe with some Python or C++. But this should really be interesting. So that was the first thing. The second one is that uh, if you're interested in the robot, you can. we have a community website that's called community, basically. So the address is community.aldebaran.com. And you can create an account, download for free the software. So if you want to try it to see how it is to program at the moment for the, for the robot, this is something that you can uh, easily do through this, uh, through this website. And once again, we are really looking for people that are interested in robotics, that have ideas about what robots will do tomorrow for us. So if it's your case, this is going to be in a few years a really important business. So join now because the earlier you get there and the more experience you will gather. So this is something that is, uh, I wanted to tell you and we'll be happy to welcome you inside of the community. Great. Thank you very much. You want to close or? Yes. So uh, again, thanks. Thanks to Nicholas and, and Steve. Um, and uh, now. <laughs> and thank you for inviting us. Sure. You're quite welcome. Um, also, we have a few minutes, so we'll do a raffle. So uh, I guess if you want to write down your name, email address. Actually, I don't need an email address. I have, oh, I do for the IntelliJ. So if you have a, a business card or a piece of paper, write your name and email address. We'll, uh, we'll take that now. We'll be a bunch of books. Uh, so let's do that now. Okay, um, and for folks on the online stream, I, I answered Mike's question via Twitter. He was wondering what the the fastest available ARM chip is for um, doing Java, ME, and SE development. And for SE, that would probably be the the Odroid. It's made by a Korean company, and it's a 1.7 gigahertz quad-core IMX6. 
needless to say, it draws quite a bit more power than the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> but it's really cheap. I think it's only 60 bucks for the a quad core um, CPU, which is pretty unheard of for a development board. And thanks everyone for joining the live stream. I'm going to cut the live stream now. <laughs>